Good morning, sir. Good morning, Akshay. How are you, sir? Ah, the good news is uh, my RT-PCR uh, report has come. It is negative for uh, COVID and, uh, <clears throat> sorry, it's negative for COVID, but they also did a HR uh, CT uh, scan of the lungs. I have a bit of uh, pneumonia in the left lung on the top. If it is at the bottom, it's dangerous. It is on the top. That has nothing to do with uh, the uh, this thing, uh, coronavirus. It does. It's not COVID. That's a proper negative. So this I have to take antibiotics, which I am taking since yesterday. Uh, I have a doctor of 40 years, more than 40 years that I've been consulting. Yes, sir. So, now people are saying that we should not use the antibiotics and steroids. Not steroids. Antibiotics you should use if you have an infection. I there have... is a chance to get the black fingers. That right is a, that's with steroids. Steroids and tap water. You're not supposed to take steroids uh, with tap water. You are supposed to take it with uh, distilled water. Steroids. But uh, not too many people have uh, access to distilled water. So, which basically means that uh, um it's not uh, what should we say uh it's not a good thing uh to take steroids with tap water i'm not on steroids i'm just on a regular antibiotic uh doxycycline which belongs to the tetracycline antibiotics uh, family so that doesn't do anything. Antibiotics and steroids are two different things. Yes, sir. Completely different things. If you have any infection, you have to take an antibiotic. Mm -hmm. But I don't know if I have an infection or it is... Actually, I didn't tell you what happened uh, the uh, day before yesterday while taking a capsule. And it's a capsule of uh, bacteria for the gut or the intestines. So that thing, when I put it in my mouth, it split open the capsule. Half of it went into my esophagus. The rest went into my trachea. So I had a huge coughing fit. Uh, it lasted quite a while. And then that uh, capsule bit that went into the trachea, it finally came out. Because that's called gag uh, cough. Which is, it's, the cough will prevent it from going into the, further down into the, trachea but since the content of it is uh, bacteria in powdered form the thing so that could have gone into the it could have gone into the lung that's why it's in the upper lung yes, upper parts of the lung so that could have caused the infection. You never know. <laughs> what we do know is it caused something caused an inf infection. 
but there was nothing else that happened except this particular event. Mm -hmm. So, so let's get going then. Yes, sir. Yeah. So um, yesterday we were talking about uh, the liberalization. of the Indian icon the liberalization of the Indian economy and uh, uh, the idea that I was trying to tell you, uh, the propose to you, is that uh, uh, this is not the equivalent the reason why I asked you for an extra class is because this is a point that needs to be pondered upon properly uh, the liberalization that took place is not the equivalent of globalization you must understand that globalization has two components, okay? Broadly speaking, I'm not uh, getting into the nitty gritties of things. The first component is the movement of people across various countries the movement the second component is the movement of money uh, in the form of investments in different parts of the world. These are the two components of globalization. Now, if you look at what exactly happened. The first process, the process of uh, people moving across various countries in the world, this is something, sorry. Let me put it here.
Okay, so the discovery of uh, the North American continent and uh, the South American continent and the rush for colonies uh, to these continents, especially by Spain, which went to the South American continent, and that's where you hardly have any presence of the French and the British and the Dutch. You don't have those people there. Portuguese did go to uh, South America. Brazil, in fact, is the biggest country there, and it was a Portuguese colony, and uh, the spoken language there is Portuguese and not Spanish. Uh, so that was one thing that happened when we talk about uh, the movement of people across various countries in the world. Uh, going to the new continents, uh, the Americans and the French, uh, and with a little bit of uh, uh, the Dutch also, went mainly to the North American continent. They went mainly to the North American continent, and that is why uh, you have the USA and uh, Canada, which are, uh, with the exception of the uh, French-speaking territories uh, in Canada, um, they are uh, English uh, uh, colonies. And, uh, but later on, uh, when the expansion of America was taking place, the largest immigrant community that went uh, to the, especially the United States of America, were the Germans. And uh, <clears throat> I'm not sure how many of you are aware of this, that even today the largest immigrant community uh, in terms of uh, the size of the population, largest immunit, uh, immigrant community is the German community. Uh, due to various things like uh, the First World War and the Second World War, and because of the Germans and the Americans fighting, on opposite sides, the Germans have generally kept a low profile. And because they've also lost both the wars, please remember that, that is the important thing. Since they lost both the wars, so you will find that there is a reluctance on their part to uh, assert their uh, German identities. And uh, for a large part, initially in uh, uh, parts of America, which started, uh, you know, somewhere around Florida, and uh, if you went up to uh, North Carolina, South Carolina, and you went towards the Midwest, Okay, which is uh, Montana, and uh, if you look at uh, uh, what is this, uh, Nebraska, uh, and if you look at uh, um, Wisconsin, uh, this is where you have uh, the concentration of the German population, and uh, even today you find. Uh, what are actually called German towns. You know, the Americans have made a very big this thing about uh, there being uh, 
uh, melting pot of cultures, which isn't true at all, which isn't true at all, uh, because the Germans initially lived in German towns and they were very, very subdued. They were scared that they will uh, incur the wrath of, uh, they'll incur the wrath of the uh, people in power which happen to be the Anglo-Saxon Protestants from England. And they are still the dominant community in terms of power, not in terms of number. Okay, and uh, <clears throat> so uh, people, there were German towns, there are still German towns. And uh, people have kept a low profile, though they are the largest immigrant community and uh, then there are these Dutch uh, people who went who are again in the Midwest and uh, these are people who constitute mainly the Bible Belt as it is called you know like we have the cow belt here which is where the uh, all the religious uh, the, well, I don't want to use everybody is not a fanatic just because they believe in religion. Uh, let's say the religious uh, people with a religious bent of mind, they live in uh, these parts, which we call the cow belt. And the cow belt will stretch from Rajasthan uh, through Haryana. Uh, but mainly Uttar Pradesh, Bihar, Jharkhand, parts of Madhya Pradesh that border Uttar Pradesh. And uh, uh, so the, that is the cow belt. So just as we have the cow belt here, uh, a respectable description for that is also the Doab region. Do is to Ab, very funnily, uh, in Sanskrit, Abha, or actually it is Abham, okay? It, in Sanskrit, it means water. In uh, Persian or Farsi as well, it means water. It's the same word, Ab without the emphasis on the b and making it b, which is abham. For them, it is just ab. Okay, so that is because even uh, Farsi is uh, an Indo-European language with the dollops of influence of uh, Sanskrit. So, uh, so the, it's called the Doab region or the land between the two rivers, which is the Yamuna and the Ganga. Okay, that is the land. But, uh, uh, but I think a better description of that is, would be the cow belt. So similarly up in the north, uh, sorry, in the, in the uh, USA, you have this uh, Bible Belt, which is uh, dominated mainly by people who are from uh, Germany uh, and also people who have come from uh, the Netherlands. Okay, and uh, they all have their own different settlements. And similarly, Irishmen, are not the British look down on the Irish, by the way. Okay, the British believe that the Irish are uncivilized drunkards, and which they are. Uh, you go to Ireland on a Saturday evening, a Sunday morning, you'll find people so drunk that they couldn't make it home and they're just lying on pavement, sleeping it off. There aren't too many of those on uh, regular Sundays, but on St. Patrick's Day, 
uh, St. Patrick is the patron saint of uh, Ireland. And uh, on St. Patrick's Day, they drink so much uh, that uh, if you go to uh, Dublin, you'll find people sprawled all over in public parks, pavements, everywhere, drunk and gone. Not gone as in dead. They'll wake up when the sun is hot and or till the police came and come and uh, pick them up and send them home. So the Irish have a very poor reputation and uh, therefore uh, and the Irish are not the well-to-do people in America even today. Uh, so the very few Irish people who are rich. So you have these Irish towns, which are called Irish shanties, S-H-A-N-T-Y. So America is not a melting pot. Uh, and initially there was uh, also some French presence, but that moved into the southern uh, tip of uh, Canada and away from the uh, northern uh, tip of the United States. So territories like Montreal, we call it Montreal, the Americans call it Montreal, the people who live in Montreal call it uh, Montreal, that's the French pronunciation, Montreal. And uh, so these, and uh, Toronto, these are the regions where you find the French settlements, but they are not in any significant numbers in America. But let's not get into this too much. So the discovery of the new continents led to a lot of people. And I keep telling you that uh, the Spanish thought They'll become the richest economy in the world by mining uh, silver, which was available in plenty in the new world. And uh, the Spanish influence also comes into Central America, uh, which is right up to uh, Mexico, which is actually called uh, Mexico. The pronunciation is Mexico. That's the pronunciation of Mexico. Uh, and uh, the Spanish are there in uh, America as well, in states like Louisiana, Texas, which was originally called uh, Tejas, T-E-J-A-S, -E -E Tejas. And uh, then they are there in uh, states like New Mexico, uh, you'll find them in uh, uh, Kansas. Okay, so they are there uh, in pretty large numbers, but uh, the power has been because America, that's why I maintain it's not a democracy. Uh, it's a minority that rules America. Minority, I mean numerical minority, which rules America, which is the Anglo-Saxon Protestants. But movement of people took place, which is what we are talking about. And that's not the only movement. The movement also happened to countries like India, countries like China, and uh, uh, countries in uh, various Asia, where there was various parts of Asia, sorry, where even the Russians went into Central America uh, and the Japanese into Southeast Asia. Uh, and so you'll find that uh, there is a movement of people and it's not just a one way movement. And just look at the number of Indians who went abroad at that time when we were considered to be and Africa. I have forgotten about Africa. Uh, so many people went to Africa. And uh, 
<clears throat> uh, the uh, there was no there wasn't a difficulty to travel across the the world as we see today we have a lot of difficulties in traveling across the world but uh, this is something uh, that happened later uh, after uh, the 1950s as more and more uh, colonies became independent the movement of people also started becoming very difficult rules of immigration uh, and all that uh, were tightened up and uh, they were very very it was a very difficult process to go from one part of the world to another sorry sorry about that uh so uh the the thing i uh, wanted to tell you uh was uh, that uh, uh right now the movement of people is difficult and trump was trying to make it even more difficult but the 20th century by and large except for this uh uh american uh, uh india and indians and chinese going to america you don't find too much movement of population okay what we find is a movement of money previously people were afraid of investing in foreign markets when i say previously that is prior to the uh, emergence of the digital economy a computerized economy prior to that people were not they thought many times over uh putting their monies in uh, uh what we call uh, different markets and that to uh markets like uh, the third world markets as they were called then now there is no three world system so please don't refer to any country as a third world country please either if you want to please call it either a developed country or uh an developing country or um uh under developed country or undeveloped country they are all four uh different things and we could look at the theories of development they will occupy quite a bit of our time if we look into theories of development uh but uh, there is no third world uh, that kind of classification anymore so please don't use that and even if you find somebody using that please don't take it at a uh, thing as a correct usage you can't have a third world without having a first and second world what was uh, considered to be the second world is today below india in terms of its uh, monetary strength or the economic strength and that is the reason why the other day i spoke so much about uh, rajiv gandhi and uh, nehru and how their vision for education and computerization respectively helped india get to the position where it is today uh i think it is really a uh, uh, matter of uh, great uh, importance i wouldn't call it pride that we are now off the list of even developing countries we are now a developed country that is how we are looked at globally this is not been done by us 
This has not been done by us. This has been done by various uh, international agencies, including the UNDP. So, uh, and the UNESCO. So if you look at uh, these, we have been taken off the list of uh, uh, developing countries or underdeveloped countries. And uh, that uh, I will come back to when, because Akshay asked me, Yesterday or uh, the I don't know the day before. On Saturday, sir. On Saturday, yeah, yes. He asked me, uh, "Why are we subsidizing the education of people who are going away uh, from India?" Uh, I'll be answering that. Uh, if I don't, uh, please remind me. Okay, Akshay. Look at the clock when it is somewhere around 9.20. If by then I haven't yet come to the point you wanted me to clarify, just remind me, intervene wherever I am and say that you have to answer this uh, around 10.20 if I don't reach that point. So anyway, so uh, today we have the digital economy and uh, the digital economy is what catapulted us out of poverty. Uh, we don't have the poverty that we had some time ago. The kind of poverty that you see today is a kind of poverty that exists in any country. Our poverty is no longer that which is uh, comparable to the poverty that you find in Africa than those kind of countries, no. Okay, uh, our main problem is that we have a population density, which is alarming, but this population being very young, I have talked to you about this. This is called uh, uh, demographic dividend. And uh, this demographic dividend, people are saying, uh, were saying rather, will be good for us till the year 2040. Uh, we'll continue to have a very young population and we will have a tech savvy population. And that is in the southern part of the country. And I once quoted Bill Gates who made this uh, rather telling statement where he said, uh, the hardest working people that I have seen in the world are uh, the Chinese and the South Indians. Now, it is a telling statement because Bill Gates really doesn't know what is happening in China, so he had to include the whole of China. And I told you that we have this problem of enclave development in India, and that is there even in China. So except for uh, three or four territories, which are showcased by the Chinese as places where there is tremendous uh, uh, growth in terms of the manufacturing sector, uh, the other parts, we really don't know what exactly is happening because the Chinese won't allow us or allow anyone from the world to take a peek and see what is the situation in the rest of China. But uh, the thing about India is everything is transparent and I don't say it in a bad way, I say it in a good way. Even our corruption is transparent. So if you look at this, therefore, then um, we, we do know what people know what they're dealing with when they're dealing with India. People don't know what they're dealing with when they're dealing with China. Okay, so that works in favor of India. Now, just let me uh, finish this point about globalization, uh, about the movement of money in the context of this digital economy. Because we went in for digital uh, economy and the southern part of the country is known for mathematics, uh, not the northern part of the country. I This is a 
uh, a thing to ponder about. Uh, you say Vedic maths and all those things that came from the ancient period and all those were up north. Okay, uh, and not just north, uh, they were in Iraq, they were in the Khurasan region, then they were in Afghanistan, and they were uh, in what are areas of Pakistan today, like Baluchistan and all those. And uh, then they came into India. Now look at all these uh, so-called Aryan uh, places. Uh, where is maths there? What kind of a mathematician has anyone produced in those areas? What kind of mathematics, mathematics education do you find in uh, these areas? Are, are there any countries, Central American, Central Africans, so sorry, Central Asians, are any of them known for mathematics? No, it's the South Indians who are known for mathematics. I, it really is something worth thinking about. I don't have an answer. So please don't ask me a question about that. I really don't have an answer. As yet, maybe one day I'll find an answer. Maybe I'll find an answer. But as yet, I don't have an answer. The development of mathematics in South India in the medieval and modern periods is something which is, it defies the whole logic of the Tamilians saying that we are not Aryans. We are Dravidians, but that is anyway, it was uh, Brahman versus non-Brahman expressed in racial terms. Okay, uh, Brahman versus non-Brahman uh, argument uh, expressed in racial terms of Aryans versus Dravidians because nobody has as yet ex established uh, a race called Dravidians. Dravida is supposed to be the region, the peninsular region was referred to as Dravida, okay? And uh, that's not a racial uh, thing. So nobody has so far been able to establish either an ethnicity or a racial categorization called Dravidian, so to speak. So anyway, it's one of those really uh, mind tickling things, it makes you sit and wonder, how did this happen? Because our down south, people can just crack mathematics, just like that. I've seen so many students who don't even have proper teachers. Uh, and uh, by that, I mean proper uh, maths teachers. And these people, do exceedingly well in mathematics. And uh, when in the early phase of uh, 3G technology coming out, they were actually 10th uh, standard or 10th class and uh, 11th and 12th class students creating apps for cell phones. And look at all the startups. They're all in either Bangalore or Hyderabad. Some of them are there in Chennai. But they're all here. They are not down there. Uh, up there, sorry. They're all down here. So that's a, an interesting question to ponder about.
Now, when you look at this movement of uh, money, what did the digital economy do? The digital This is what the digital economy did. It restricted the movement of the people. Like I said, you can only go to the United States of America. And on that too, only if you know mathematics. And whether you're a civil engineer you're a metallurgical engineer or uh, somebody who did uh, mines uh, engineering you can do you could have done all that but you go to america and you write the algorithm and you write the code meant for various software and uh, these software are the ones, uh, softwares are the ones that uh, the Americans want uh, for their own reasons, because the digital economy is something that helps people put money in one place and move it out if they want to. In the pre-digital uh, economy period, uh, it was believed that if you wanted to uh, move out your investment from one place to another, first you suffered losses uh, because of the time and also because of the fact that you have invested in something physical. And uh, then taking your money to another part would take its own time. I remember if uh, there was a time when if I received a check from say Delhi, it took 15 days to cash that check. 15 days is what it took to cash that check. Now, Nobody wants you to have a check. Everybody wants you to have a digital bank account, which you use either from your computer or on your phone. All you need to do is the name of the bank, your bank account number, your name, and the IFS code. And if you give them these details, the money comes to you within 15 or 20 minutes. That's it. Not more. Globally to the time scale, maybe an hour or two. Not more than that. Not more than that. But if it is a large scale thing, it takes up to 24 hours. If it's a large scale movement, if you're talking about millions of dollars being moved, then it takes up to 24 hours, but you can move it. What is 24 hours? What used to take 12 months perhaps, or six months, even if you put it very optimistically, nothing was less than six months. Where is six months and where is uh, 
12 uh, uh, sorry uh, 24 hours that's nothing and so you have the growth of different kinds of funds uh, you have mutual funds and then you have this this is a very interesting thing hedge fund Okay, mutual funds are floated. Uh, you can invest in it. Anyone can invest in it. Now, the place of investment, previously when we thought about investment, we, think, we thought about banks. Now, we don't think about banks. Any investment you make is either a mutual fund or a hedge fund or some digital economy related thing. Even if you put your money in a bank, instead of you doing it directly, uh, if you put it in a fixed deposit, instead of you putting the money directly into the bank, uh, I mean into the funds, into mutual funds or, or hedge funds, what happens is, the bank does it. So there is this whole, you must have heard of this new, it's a very new term and it is held almost is in great reverence. Even doctors and uh, other professionals who save lives and things like that don't have that kind of uh, veneration from the population. Uh, you're, if you're an investment banker, okay, so if you're an investment banker, then you're the one who's deciding which one a certain money goes into. And uh, how do you make your money out of it? By being an investment banker. That's all matters because you get percentages. So you should know when to move move the fund from one mutual fund to another. So that is for domestic uh, transactions. Hedge funds are usually not just domestic transactions. They are also international transactions. Even mutual funds do have uh, uh, international transactions uh, in the form of FIIs. Okay, foreign institutional investors. So you must have seen those uh, Franklin Templeton and Citibank is uh, exiting India from traditional banking. And uh, Citibank is only going to concentrate now on uh, mutual funds and hedge funds and all that. So they have decided to pull the plug of their banking operations uh, from 20 countries across the globe. India is one of them. Uh, but uh, unlike say in the case of a Poland or uh, in the case of a Sri Lanka, where uh, they are not betting on anything, uh, in India, they are betting on the economy and saying that we will remain here uh, in the form of some fund as a mutual fund or a hedge fund or whatever it is, they'll be here. So it just might mean that uh, people like me who have a couple of credit cards uh, of the city bank, I'll probably lose those cards but there are enough banks giving cards out anyway so this is no big deal uh, i have without my knowing i have realized that i have something like six or seven different banks and uh, uh, and credit cards and uh, to keep my credit rate going i have to spend so it's a good thing if these people pull out but my fear is what if I have an emergency, so I need more cards. That is my fear. 
you know, first I'll pay off through the credit card and then I'll wonder about how I'm going to repay the credit card. So anyway, so hedge funds and all these. What is a hedge fund? A hedge fund is a borderline thing where it shows promise of growing. Okay, it shows a promise of growing, but one doesn't really know if it will grow or if it doesn't grow. So what people do is it's called hedging a bet or betting on a hedge fund. Okay, you can say either of the two things. And if that happens, if that kind of a thing happens, then what you do is you'll say that this is a high growth uh, fund. It's likely to bring greater returns in smaller time periods. So let's invest in this. So thanks to hot money, where FIIs and uh, FDI, foreign direct investment, sorry. I told you the only difference is the quantum of money. FIIs are restricted to some $10 million, I think. And, uh, uh, or is it 10,000? No, not 10, 10,000 is too small. I really don't know. Uh, FDI runs into unlimited, uh, so they both mean the same there. It's just that there is a, a difference in the amounts. Actually, I wanted to organize a talk on this uh, in the evening, uh, one of these days, but uh, it's uh, the poor attendance, uh, people not coming. I can't call somebody who is an expert in a particular domain and you know, I know many people like that who can enrich your knowledge and about 10,000 times more than what I'm doing. Okay. Uh, there are people like that. Please believe me. And they are in Hyderabad. They, I don't have to import them from somewhere. And it's just that this whole lackadaisical attitude and, uh, you know, it's not a phrase. The Hyderabadiness of Hyderabad has died after uh, the influx of populations from various uh, parts of India uh, has happened. And uh, the Telangana, separate Telangana has killed Hyderabad. Uh, we used to have one saying, Chalneda ala Balkishan. So that was one. It is like that. Chalneda? Or there was one which was called Light Law. So everything, everybody Light Law. So I have six students, seven students, and if I put somebody and say, speak to six students, I don't think it's going to be very uh, good for them. So I can't organize those guest lectures, which I would love to have organized. I don't mind doing it even in this class, not just in the evening, but I can't, that's it. I don't have the audience. Anyway, so mutual funds, hedge funds, all these things have come, hedge funds is hedging your bets. And uh, if you think that the fund is going down, you pull your money from there and put it in another fund. It could be in the same market or you go and put it in another market. So you have portfolio managers, investment bankers, portfolio managers, needless to say, company secretaries, chartered accountants. Now, these are all the high growth carriers. These are all the high growth carriers because now the biggest thing that matters most 
is money and everybody is trying to increase their money so everybody's increasing in these kind of investing in these kind of uh, uh, funds so this hot money concept has uh, this hot money concept has changed this landscape of investments so digital economies countries that were able to make a very quick transition to a digital economy benefited now when i told you now i'll get back to the story of uh, so globalization so please remember this globalization is not a new phenomenon it began with uh, with colonialism so let me just reiterate that particular point before i move forward uh, even liberalization had happened but what had happened is that uh, once in countries became independent uh then they tried to put some barriers on uh international trade because you didn't want uh money from this uh, from a country being siphoned off so what had happened therefore is that uh, uh the countries were they had to provide employment to people that was the promise of the freedom movement that uh, we will not live like beggars anymore that was the promise and so too many top level jobs and too few people working on the ground and all these led to stagflation even in countries like ours and it was uh some people even say that there was some kind of not deflation as the opposite of inflation uh deflation is when you don't have uh, any kind of in inflation of your currency okay that the opposite of that is deflation uh this is not being used in that sense some people said this is not even stagflation whatever was there that money has been exhausted so it's like removing air out of a tire deflating it like that not in terms of its worth the currency's worth and things like that the market had completely deflated there was nothing to do and so this miraculous recovery that happened uh because of the full liberalization till then we were only partly liberalized uh, a little more of liberalization came from rajiv gandhi in 1985 and by 1990 91 it had become very very clear that we just couldn't carry on any more but enough had been done in the education sphere enough had been done in the uh, case of uh, uh computerization and the adoption of computer technologies and the quick introduction of uh, computer education through non formal channels okay so you had uh, nit national institute of information technology the way you, it is named nit you would think it's a government organization it wasn't uh, it is uh, something that was into software development and they also offered various training programs and uh, you wouldn't even have heard of the languages of those times they were either cobol c o b o l cobol or uh, fortran 
or uh, they were what was a pascal pascal was for uh, scientific applications fortran for was also for some kind of uh, academic scientific applications cobol was <clears throat> the main language that was used to write business software so a lot of businesses went in for software and they started opening up their own uh, computer divisions so that people work there and take care of this and uh, then you had this uh, big rebellion uh, not what I want, sorry big revolution uh, that came in the form of the C language, which changed the way in which people wrote a computer program. Previously, the way people wrote a computer program was with uh, how with the protocol that you have, you would interact with your com with your computer the way you would interact with another human being. So it was slow, it was time consuming. Uh, and then somebody found Sanskrit and they said Sanskrit has very pithy communication. So that became the inspiration. And from that, uh, people went to the creation of the C language. They went to the creation of uh, HTML. They went to the creation of C++, visual C++, and then once internet technology started coming in because of the World Wide Web, which was a 1990s phenomenon, uh, there was the Java scripts and Java uh, programs. And the thing that you find about computer education is that it is non-linear, okay? It is completely non-linear. It's not like you have to have a base and you have to start and go up, up, up. No, you want to do JavaScript, you do JavaScript. If you didn't know anything else before that, it didn't matter. All, it mat all that mattered was, can you do this? or can you not do this? All that mattered was that. So if you knew mathematics, if you knew algorithm, if you knew how to write a code, then you could pick up anything. You could pick up any platform. You could pick up, uh, uh, what was that? Um, .NET technologies uh, of uh, Microsoft or uh, which was the other uh, program, which is a, it, it was some uni, uh, non-usage non of information. Okay, that's what this does to you. Uh, uni, wait a minute, that's, anyway. I'll tell you when it comes to me. Unix, yep. Unix platform, UNIX. Uh, Unix platform, or it was .NET platform, it really did. Then Oracle developed its own platform. And Sun Microsystems was trying to create um, a competition to uh, Microsoft and they were doing pretty well. And so Oracle bought them over and Oracle now is big competition for Microsoft, not on personal uh, computers. Uh, that's where Microsoft still has some, this thing, but uh, otherwise Microsoft is not there on phones. Microsoft is not there on commercial applications, large scale applications. Uh, it's almost vanishing. So it's an interesting scenario to see where Microsoft will be five or 10 years down the line. Okay. Uh, 
until and unless people are still using desktop computers and laptop computers, uh, there will be no relevance for Microsoft. That is the basic reality. Uh, anyway, so what I'm trying to say is, so uh, we were primed up. We were primed up for all these because uh, all these institutions were allowed to flourish in the 80s under Rajiv Gandhi. Apple, uh, NIIT was one. Apple was another thing. It uh, later on became App Tech Computers, but otherwise it was called Apple uh, Computers. And the certificates that people got from these uh, companies were valid. And they were even considered as formal education by those who did a BSc and then studied a one-year diploma from either Aptec or NIIT. It was considered formal uh, ed education uh, to go to the United States of America uh, because they wanted people to fix the Y2K bug. And uh, so you see, uh, slowly universities took over. One of the earliest universities to start offering uh, computer application programs was the University of Hyderabad. They started a DCA diploma in computer applications. And then you had uh, the MCA program, Master of Compu uh, Computer Applications. And then uh, you had uh, uh, various state universities also picking up these programs by tying up, by tying up with either Aptec or NIIT. They provided the whole uh, software. They provided the teachers. Uh, the state universities only uh, gave the degrees. Okay, so, and slowly they started recruiting people and uh, so you see our preparedness educationally and that is why i spoke so long that day about our education the vision of nehru and the vision of rajiv gandhi you cannot deny that that is what stood us in good stead when we were facing at a crisis that would have put us right at the bottom of the ocean floor. We managed to snap out of it simply because there was the preparedness in the country for it. There are a number of things that are wrong with India. Number of things. I'm not very happy. I'm not very happy with quite a few things that are happening in India even, especially now and more so in social sciences. But if you look at technological education, that has never suffered. And unfortunately, even that is going into the hands of private universities now, which essentially means that the poor and the talented will not be able to pay the kind of fees that is demanded of them. Fortunately for us, fortunately for us, there are enough public universities in South India offering, uh, uh, you know, these kind of courses, mathematics still hasn't died down. Up north, if you looked at even old universities like the University of Delhi, Jamia Millia, they didn't even have a department of science. They didn't even have, JNU didn't have when it started. It started 
without any science department. There's no science. There's a school of international studies. There's a school of social sciences. There's a school of languages. That's it. And when I was studying there, they opened the school of uh, computer applications. Then they opened the school of life sciences. And even today, JDU still doesn't have a robust science program. Up north, it is difficult. And that is the reason why you have Bennett University that all these private universities that have come are now offering technological courses. They have realized that the, the southern part of the country has gone way, way ahead in terms of science and maths education compared to the northern part of the country. And so they see this as a market opportunity. They are not doing it as service. That's, service is never the motto of any private institution. Service is not the motto of a private institution. Profit is the motto. Okay, and uh, so in Telangana, we'll have physical directors and all being uh, appointed as vice chancellors. And our university will keep God knows where they'll go. Um, but at least there are central universities now in Telangana and in South India, quite a few of which are okay. Uh, in the science faculties. And uh, we also had a robust management, business management program right through. It wasn't just the IIMs. Uh, you had the MMS courses being offered in uh, Master of Management Studies, it was called, uh, by uh, institutions like the Jamnalal Bajaj institutions, uh, the Narsi Monji uh, institution, which is now a university, and they also have a wing here. They're supposed to construct a full-fledged campus somewhere near Jetcherla, and they're not doing it. Uh, and then, of course, uh, symbiosis and uh, then you have, uh, you've had, uh, uh, what was this uh, other very famous, Simba, uh, Sydenham. Sydenham was another well-known uh, institution, which is offering management education and all these things were required for the transition into the uh, liberalized economy that would go through the second phase of globalization. And the complete liberalization of the economy. We were prepared for that. And uh, therefore, we began making a quick transition we recovered pretty quickly. Good story to tell till now. Now comes the underbelly. The underbelly is this. Thank you. 
at the time of independence there was enclave development in india what exactly is enclave development enclave development is some areas are very developed some areas are totally undeveloped so if you look at what were the developing area the developed areas the developed by indian standards they did see capitalism come in there because these were under british administration uh the developed areas were the presidencies so delhi developed because when the 1857 revolution revolt rather ended up uh, in favor of the british they decided to dislodge the decided to dislodge the moguls and uh, make it their capital so they took over the city so that there would be nothing left for the moguls to try and make a comeback uh and uh, these were ports the presidencies uh madras calcutta and bombay they developed also because of the fact that the people there had some kind of uh, what should i say the people had some kind of uh, culture of education admittedly it was mainly upper caste so you had the bhadra lok okay in calcutta then uh, in madras you had uh, the brahmins especially ayengars who went into business when the anti brahmin movement started with the justice party with the dk the dravida kalagam and then the dmk the dravida munnetra kalagam and then the iadmk all india dravidam netra kalagam i don't know where exactly they are in the rest of the country but they claim that they are all over india okay at least when uh, uh, the mim says it's now aimim i see them contesting elections in uh, bihar and even winning some so okay so that's fine but uh, i'm uh, not very sure about the rest anyway so especially the iyengars they went to coimbatore 
uh, once the whole uh, problem started and quite a few of them. I don't know if you know this. Uh, at the time of independence, the Telugu population in Madras was 60% or more. The Tamilian part uh, uh, population was far lesser than that. Then if you went to Coimbatore, uh, the Coimbatore people uh, were all mainly Telugu speakers and they became businessmen. Uh, and they were Brahmins because they said, all right, if you don't allow us to compete for jobs and the, the, the Brahmins, they're faced very open revolt. Uh, the Nadars and the Mudaliyars and all these people, they used to go around with scissors and uh, if they found a Brahmin wearing a thread, they cut the thread off and threw it. So that was the kind of thing that they faced. Uh, so what they did is they moved out of uh, Madras uh, and it should they say Madras. It's actually Madras because it's Madrasa Patna, which has been shortened to Madras by the British. But uh, the Tamilians and Telugus both say Madras. And a true blue, uh, what should I say? Uh, what the what the North Indians call Madrasis, they still insist on calling Chennai Madras. They don't like to be called, they don't like to call it uh, 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 Chennai. Okay. They insist on calling it Madras and look at how uh, uh, this thing it is, how sad it is. Uh, as the say in 1987, when I was still studying in Delhi, uh, the Dhobi who used to come, used to refer, he used to think, I don't know, my Hindi is pretty good. Huh? I don't know how I picked it up. I can speak that Shuddha Hindi without an accent. And uh, so this guy used to think I was a North Indian. And uh, this Dhobi who used to come, he used to say, Oh, Madrasi, hai na, wahan pe. all Madrasis were Telugus actually. But so anything, so there was this famous dialogue, anything south of Hyderabad was Madras for the North Indians. Okay, anything south of, they only knew about Hyderabad, nothing other than that. The rest was all Madras, Madrasi. That was the amount of knowledge they had in the 1980s okay about south india they heard about hyderabad thanks to ntr's antics in delhi going and in a wheelchair and prostrating in front of gyani zail singh and you know all those stupid things that he did uh, the, which made all kinds of uh, unnecessary news that made people aware of uh, Hyderabad, but they didn't couldn't distinguish between. They didn't even know what were the languages that were spoken in the southern part of the country. Okay, anyway, that is. Let's get away with it. So we had these littoral areas, which are ports and. Uh, uh, in Madras, you had the Iyengars, and in uh, Bombay was cosmopolitan. And uh, it had various business uh, businesses. like uh, that of the Tatas, the Pallonjis, it's actually Shapur Pallonjis, but I'm 
Palonjis and uh, uh, what was that uh, fabric? Bombay dyeing. Yeah. That reminds me of a joke, but I don't have the time to tell it. Bombay dyeing, uh, then Khaitan, all kinds of, uh, and, uh, oh, oh, oh. Kirlo skirts, actually. Let me put that. Uh, so all these industrialists were there in Bombay. Uh, then you had some development in other ports, other littoral areas. Uh, like uh, Surat, Cochin, uh, on the west coast and uh, on the east coast, even uh, Vishakapatnam. called uh, Voltaire. I really don't know how this word came and the British used to call it Voltaire. So there was some development in these areas as well. And Hyderabad, like I told you, was developed thanks to the Nizam. So I'm not bringing that. So we had enclave development. So Nehru chose the democratic centralism model to bring parity in development. So this was a model used by Lenin. Lenin said all the underdeveloped and undeveloped areas of the Soviet Union, which are mainly the Central Asian republics, all of them had to be brought uh, to the same level of development as the uh, development that one found in Russia, parts of Russia, Ukraine, Bielorussia, and uh, uh, parts of uh, Finnish Russia. So all these kind of uh, areas which saw lopsided growth, he thought through democratic centralism, we can do it. Nehru also chose this particular model. Indira Gandhi strengthened it with uh, her planning commission uh, where taxes alliance share of the taxes, even though they are collected by the states, they went into the coffers of the uh, central government and uh, you know, these states had to go back and ask for uh, money uh, explaining the reasons why they wanted so much money and because the interstate council which was the body that was actually empowered to deal with this uh, was not functioning efficiently the planning commission was created uh, and it's a, an extra constitutional body whereas the interstate council is a constitutional body uh, which has lost its relevance uh, and uh, BJP recently changed the planning commission to Niti Aayog. Uh, I really don't know what is the Niti in it. Uh, anyway, uh, so we had this democratic centralism, which is Nehru told people, listen, we have all got independence. Some of you are very well developed. So we have to help those other people who are not very well developed. So you will find that industrial houses like the Tatas went and set up things in Jamshedpur, which is a very backward area. Uh, the Birlas went to Pilani 
and did something there. The Kirloskars went into Madhya Pradesh, Pitampur, okay, and the Firodias went there, uh, as did the Bajaj, uh, they, uh, and the Mahindras. They all moved to different parts of the country trying to help development. But once this digital economy came, this democratic centralism vanished and very unwittingly, very, very unwittingly, we went into federalism. Now, nowhere in the Constitution do you find the word federal. None of our institutions will have, none of the government institution, uh, institutions will have the word federal. It's all central. And like I told you, even till today, the tax structures are centralized. Okay, and with the BJP again becoming a now a party that can stand on its own feet, uh, it is now going back to the centralization tendencies. Now, federalism came for two reasons. One, the digital economy and the divide in scientific uh, education, let me put it that way. It's not scientific, science education. And by science, I'm including maths as well. The, this is one of the two drivers, the digital economy and the other from Oh. Okay, coalition government with the support of regional parties, which are the regional parties, all South based. Okay, and the Congress did have a presence uh, in uh, Karnataka uh, with S.M. Krishna. Now that worked in favor of Chandra Babu Naidu uh, because the NDA, obviously S.M. Krishna, the chief minister, couldn't go and say, I'll join the NDA or I'll support the NDA government. Chandra Babu Naidu did. And initially it was the AIA DMK that was with the NDA. They also did, Jay Lalita. So you see, they twisted, they were in a position to twist the arms of the center to give them favors. So such a big manufacturing sector went to Tamil Nadu. I can't go into the details now. Uh, I mean, very big manufacturing sector went into Tamil Nadu. And Chandra Babu Naidu 
took this opportunity to start competing. So this led to competing with whom? With Karnataka basically, and to a certain extent with uh, Tamil Nadu. So this led to competitive federalism. Competitive federalism, this led to, because Chandra Babu Naidu said, I'm not going to sit and watch Tamil Nadu and uh, SM Krishna uh, in, uh, sorry, Karnataka, go ahead while we don't get anything. So his biggest coup and contribution to the Indian federalism was I'm just putting his name as CBN was taking loans directly that means without the intervention, directly is without the intervention of the central government from the World Bank and, and IMF. This is a huge coup. Today the man is an oblivion. I don't know whether he deserves that or not. He did take recourse to too much of manipulative politics. Uh, but the basic thing was uh, that he started taking loans directly from the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund. And he said, we will service these loans. So that also altered the tax structure. When he said, we have to service the loans that we have taken directly as Andhra Pradesh, the then undivided Andhra Pradesh, then we need to have our the taxes here. The money that we are collecting here, we'll keep a majority of it here uh, and uh, send you smaller amounts. That is how he bargained. That's how he bargained and won. And that is why in his time, AP, which was 23rd on the development index, when he became chief minister, it was 23rd out of some 27 states. All these things changed, it became the third most developed state. Only, uh, yeah, only after Maharashtra, a fourth most. Maharashtra, Tamil Nadu, Karnataka, and Andhra Pradesh. From 23rd to fourth, because of this, and Karnataka did the same thing when the UPA came into government. They tried to do the same thing, but then they found that when the UPA came into government, then the BJP was in power there. And the Congress was in power here. The Raj Shekhar Reddy played the same game that NT, uh, sorry, that uh, Chandra Babu Naidu played. So there was federalism. There was federalism. The Tamil Nadu parties were playing the same game. Kerala, they get up in the morning and drink, so let's forget it. They don't count. Okay, their drinking starts at 7.30 in the morning or something. Right, so 
we have this competitive federalism that developed in the southern part of the country and it spread to the northern part of the country i'll have to finish now it's 10:41 akshay uh i'm sorry you didn't remind me but i was remembering uh i will start by answering your doubt tomorrow is that okay with you yes sir i think i didn't want to disturb you no i knew i understood that uh, will you give me one more class please because this is a very very important development okay sir will you give me one more class for this yes sir tomorrow yes sir okay sir because also it, it, sir we'll discuss the current status of federalism now yeah sure yeah. yeah no no it will be possible because i don't have so much material and i have been asked not to speak too much because of my pneumonia and uh, oh. uh, i have been speaking away to glory so uh, anyway so we'll do this one more time i mean one more class i'll really appreciate it yes sir okay sir okay yes, sir. thank you thank okay, you sir. thank, thank you. you thank you sir. thank you thank, thank you, you everyone thank you everyone